okay? Glad to see you this evening. Hope everything is going well with everybody. <coughs> and uh, we begin tonight actually going into the book of Exodus itself. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping and a little bit of things like that, and then we'll actually get into the class. There's a couple of books that I want to encourage you if you have the opportunity to buy. The first one is this one by Exodus by R. Allen Cole. He is not a member of the church, but this is a very good book, very good commentary on, uh, on the book. So again, I picked this book up as part of the Tyndall Old Testament commentaries with R. Allen Cole. Uh, secondly, I'm taking a class on Exodus at the Heritage Christian University. And um, Ed Gallagher is the teacher there. He wrote a book, and this is more, and, and Jim, this might be something you'd be interested in. Oh, you've already got it. This particular book is mainly written for the idea of teaching this book in a Bible class setting. It's got 13 weeks, and he does bring out a lot of different things in here, so let me encourage you to get to that. Uh, you can get it from Amazon, and uh, so uh, Jim, did you have to give your book back? Sir? Did you have to send your book back? No, why? All right, there were some errors in it. They caught after the first printing, and um, so uh, they had to, I had to send mine back and get another one. Uh, one way you can know if there's an error in it is go to page 217. Okay? Uh, hang on one second. All right. All right Eddie. <clears throat> okay. And down at the bottom, there's a chart. Yes. Okay, does that chart go all the way across to the edge of the page? Uh, yeah, well, as far as the, as far as the okay. print goes, yes. All right, then you, you'll probably be all right. Okay. All righty. Okay. Another commentary <clears throat> I suggest, and this is one I suggest you buy, is Truth For Today commentary on Exodus. Yep. Again, Coy, Do Coy Roper wrote this one. Again, whenever I first took the course at Heritage Christian University, he wrote a book. So it seems like, uh, and I'm saying this tongue in cheek, but it seems like a lot of these folks that are teaching these books are the guys who write books and trying to sell books. <laughs> but <laughs> that's okay if those books help us out in the long haul. So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to emphasize as we go through here. Hey, Tommy. Yes. The Cole book, it might look different than yours. It has, uh, this is the new print and it has a different cover on it. So I just want to let somebody know if they go try to order it. Okay. They see they don't see yours. It's it's this one. So it's the same. It's the same book. All righty. And <clears throat> recording that's where everybody can be a part of that. And you can see that on the video a little bit later on. Uh, tonight, we are going to get into the book of Exodus itself. And I'm going to continue by emphasizing again what Exodus tells us about God. Remember last week, we spent a little bit of time talking about the ideal of theology. And the Bible is really a book telling us about God. So we saw last week, especially in the book of Genesis, how God introduces himself. And I made the mention of the fact that we don't know exactly uh, when Genesis was written. I told you that, that probably or possibly, and this is my opinion, and, and that $2.50 will buy you a Coke. But the reality I want you to think about is the fact that he probably wrote a lot of that during the time of the wilderness wanderings. And again, he may have wrote Exodus about that same time frame. But it is, a, it is a chronology that goes all the way through there. And so as you begin to see Genesis and how God <clears throat> reveals himself there, when we come to the book of Exodus, God is revealing himself even further in the book of Exodus. And that's where I'm going to try to begin tonight. Before we go further, however, let's pray. <clears throat> thank you, Father, for the day and for the blessings you give me. And thank you for allowing me to be a teacher Yes, I pray, Father, that I do the very best job I can for your glory and your honor. Yes. I pray that you would help us Father, to honor you and praise your name and everything. Yes. Father, help us to understand that the more we understand you, the more we're going to be able to share with you with others. And Father, help us to get it right. Yes. There are so many different ideas about God and, and what he does and what he doesn't do. And, and again, it's not because people are studying the scriptures. It's just we make a God in our own image. And Father, we humbly ask you that we might understand you as you have revealed yourself to us. Please, Lord, help us. Help me to do the very best job I can. Be with every one of my students, whatever problems or trials they're dealing with in their lives. And help us, Lord, to honor you in every way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. All right, now, we talked about, like I said, some of the ideals of the theology of Genesis. Today, we're going to talk about that in Exodus. One of the things that I want to bring out to you is that, and you might jot this down, you might see this on the test, hint, 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 hint. but one of the things you might see is the idea of what does, uh, <clears throat> what does, um, uh, what does Exodus say about God? Number one, God is the God who controls history. God is the God who controls history. He is the controller of all history and all circumstance. You don't, you begin to see this in Exodus chapter one, even though his name is not mentioned all the way down to verse 20, but the, the bottom line is you see him working things out. And I want to emphasize that idea. This, the his, Hebrews, the Jews, saw God, well, I told you last week, they believed that his exodus was the supreme hack of all history, all right? And that's what gave them and allowed them to become a people of God. So as you read this book, you're going to see, <clears throat> especially as we go through this in detail, how God is working behind the scenes. And this is very important also to understand when you go into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy because of the fact that through that, God is the one who controls history. God is the one who has the right to tell us what to do, how to live. God also has the right to punish whenever we don't live up to that. God overrules all the events for the ultimate good of his people. All right. And again, that's, that says a lot about God's providence. Again, you know, he's always going to overrule it. We're going to see this in Exodus chapter one where they are under such a great deal of pressure because of the <clears throat> servitude that they're giving themselves other under. And yet as a result of this, this was really the thing that Israel grew like all that. They grew faster in this time than any other time because of what they're going through. See that, <clears throat> again, you see, as you go through this, that God shows the same love to Moses. Um, whenever Moses, thinks perhaps into himself. He's thinking that um, I'm going to save the children of Israel. Remember whenever he killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand? So maybe he was thinking all along that he was going to do it, and God did have that plan for him to do it, but what? It wasn't going to be a Moses' way. It wasn't going to be the way Moses thought about doing it. So think about it. And so where does, where does Moses wind up? On, in the backside of a desert, following sheep, right? And so as you think about this, <clears throat> you see that God is taking care of him and everything. So God is in control of all history. And I think that's very important, especially as we think about it. Secondly, God is portrayed, Gen Exodus chapter uh, 6 at verse 3, he is portrayed as the I am, all righty? And we'll get into this discussion a little bit here. So again, he says, chapter two, I am the Lord. And he says, verse three, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. And last week, if you remember, I talked about the idea that when you're looking at the Bible, a lot of times it says the Lord God, right? And you remember that word, Lord God, that word Lord, and then God, comes from two Hebrew words, Yahweh, as well as El. And I've talked about this idea that the word Yahweh suggests a personal God. Being creator and all-knowing, all-wise, but here you see him as a personal God. So, <clears throat> as he now begins to uh, emphasize that idea. He's stressing to all of them, again, what they need to know. Now, as you look at this passage, he says, I appeared to Abraham and to Jacob as God Almighty. Okay? But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. Yet, when we go back to Genesis, and this again is one of the things that, that I argue that Genesis may have been written later. But when you go back to Genesis, it talks about the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. Well, again, Moses is writing all of this. And so as we're thinking about it in that respect, we have to realize that did he in, reveal himself to Abraham, Isaac, and the others 
as a personal God, Yahweh, or was it more what? The ideal of him being creator and the one to whom everybody is there. So that's the thing we have to come into contact with, especially when we come to Exodus chapter uh, six. So when he emphasizes the idea that I have not been known to them, I did not, by my, my name, Lord, Yahweh, I was not known to them. Yet again, in Genesis, you find this phrase used time and time again. Now, here's the thing I want to emphasize to you. God has a name and a name identifies him. So you, you think about as we go through the rest of the Old Testament, you're going to read about the name of, of Molech. You're going to read about the God of Baal. You're going to read about the God of Asherah and all these other different gods. And every one of those gods' name actually identifies those gods. So when you're looking at the name God, Lord God, Yahweh El, you're seeing a personal God, but also the God that is over the universe. Okay? And I think that's very important. The words... In, in, in the Hebrew, the word name is a shorthand for character, all right? And again, that's not hard for us to understand because when we think of certain people, when we name that person's name, we immediately think of them, and a lot of times we associate their character with them, right? Whether or not they're good or evil, whether or not they're, you know, so I could mention the name Hitler, and immediately everybody thinks evil, wicked, you know, a, a murderer, I could mention some, some other name, and again, somebody would think at a totally different viewpoint. And so here's the thing <clears throat> that he's going to emphasize. Whenever they proclaim the name of Yahweh or the name of Jehovah, this is going to emphasize, again, God's character, and it's going to be the name, it's going to be the name that everything that happens to them. Listen to Exodus 33, 19. I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I am, will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Now, before it's over with today, we're going to go on and look on it in chapter 34. And in my Bible, it's on the same page. Chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. So the Lord passes before Moses and says, The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So here you have God revealing himself, and how does he want us to know him? As a merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. And I mentioned some of that last time. So as you see this idea, he's trying to get across the idea, I am, as you think of my name, I want you to think this about me. I am merciful and gracious, but what? I will by no means clear the guilty. And so we, we see that idea. It's the same idea we think about it in this respect whenever we mention the name Jesus. Immediately, what? A lot of other things come into mind. Jesus Christ, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. So all those titles, all those names tell us something about Jesus. And so, again, it helps us to understand even that much more about who he is. He is going to be the one. He starts revealing himself by his nature here. And, and it starts off by what is Exodus really about? I mean, think about that for a moment. What is it about? It's the salvation of the Jews. I mentioned last week the two, two words that are very important in this book where we find the first Revelation of these words is the word redemption and the word salvation. So, hey, brother, come on in. Glad to see you. All righty. So he continues to, as it was, show himself to the people to where, again, they know who he is. And they're trying to get to know who God is. And so that's, that's where we are. Number three, he is the God who is holy. I even mentioned that earlier, right? I mentioned that last week. Last week, I emphasized the idea that God is holy. And so when Moses is there in Exodus chapter 3 at verse 5, he says, he sees this, this burning bush, this flame of fire in a bush, and he says, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is what? Holy ground. Now, why was it holy? I mentioned this last week. It's holy because... 
God's there. And I, I challenge us again, and I, I hope to emphasize this idea um, over and over again. Maybe that would again make us stop and think about whenever we gather together as the church that we must be holy. If we're going to come before God, this holy God, we have to be holy as well. And so that calls for us to live that kind of life that God demands. The word holy suggests the idea not just set apart, though he is, but he's also the word holy suggests a moral content. The idea, he reveals himself in the Ten Commandments. Well, as he reveals himself in the Ten Commandments, what do you have? You're having there a revelation of who he is, and he's telling us how we need to be. Think about the first four commandments, right? Those are the commandments that deal with God and who he is. And then the rest of the commandments <clears throat> are you might say, as I mentioned even a little bit last week, the next ten, uh, six commandments deal with the relations that we have with one another. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And you remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then the other commands, honor your father and mother. You shall not murder, commit adultery. You shall not steal, bear false witness, or covet your neighbor's house. So all of these commands are there in Exodus chapter 20. The first four emphasize his character and emphasize why they shouldn't do certain things. The second or the last six emphasize the way we should live as a result of it. So when we think about this idea, <clears throat> when we think about this idea of holiness and how God has called us to holiness, what does that say? It emphasizes the idea that if we will be holy, we have to do what God wants, right? And that means we have to obey his will. So think about this. When we are not in the right relationship with God, whose fault is it? Right. And that necessarily means that I, all of us, have to make a decision that, as Jesus would say, not my will, but thine be done. So again, Leviticus 19, verse 2, he tells the children of Israel, they're up Mount Sinai. I remember the whole book of Leviticus, all right? So when we get them to Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 14, or a little bit after that, 17, or 19, I'm sorry, 19, and then Exodus Leviticus, as well as the first part of Numbers, is written there at Mount Sinai, because Numbers then tells us the travelogue of how they travel from there. Okay, so he's going to stress to them, and he tells them, you know, outside this book, you shall be holy for I am holy. And that same ideal is brought out in the New Testament where Peter will quote this idea and emphasize that we must be a holy people as well. So holiness <clears throat> does mean that we are set apart. But it also, when it's talking about God, it emphasizes that God's nature is so different from anything else that he is holy and set apart from everything. So a lot of people, and we do understand about God from his creation, right? We know that he's omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent. We know these things from that, but, you know, you think about how the Greeks, the Romans, and a lot of the others, again, under the, under the um, pagan system they had, think about those a lot of times, they would make gods out of every one of these things, right? The sun god, the moon god, the earth god, the god of the water, the god of, you know, when you think about all the Greek gods and all this there, the, uh, the god of, goddess of the earth, Gaia. Uh, you, you think about Poseidon. You think about all these different names of the gods, but they think that those gods are just over certain parts of creation. God is over all creation because God set up all creation. And so again, we emphasize the idea that the whole book of Exodus going on into Leviticus reiterated again in Deuteronomy is a book about how God's people needs to be holy. I mentioned last week that God is a God who remembers. So, and again, I kind of glossed over this because I couldn't remember exactly what was being said there, but it's the idea that God is a God who acts. 
That's what he means. So when he saw Noah, God remembered Noah. What does that mean? God acted on Noah's behalf. So whenever we think about the idea that God thinks about us and he remembers us, he's acting on our behalf. The greatest thing he's done in acting on our behalf is what? Sending his son to die upon the cross. Do we now sit back and think that he's still not acting? No, he's still acting on our behalf. And we've got to, again, keep that ideal in mind. And he's going to do it with the idea of the covenant. And we talked a little bit very briefly about that ideal of the covenant. All righty. God is a God who acts in salvation. All righty. Exodus 3, verse 8. <clears throat> I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up into a land, good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the land of the Canaanites. So we talked about that. Here again is where this ideal of salvation is first found. Okay? This is a characteristic of God from the very beginning and continues. He's always there to rescue the oppressed and the helpless. And again, Think about the idea that how, did, how does that fit with Jesus? Does he not rescue the helpless? Are we not caught in the throes of sin? Did he not, when we were baptized into Christ, raised to walk in newness of life, did he not give us the ability to break the power of sin in our lives? Absolutely. So he is a God that stands and is there to help us. All righty? He is a God who acts in judgment. He is a God who acts in judgment. All righty? Now, you think about the idea of judgment. We don't want to talk about that a lot, but the, the bottom line is, is what? This is how God looks at sin. To us, sin is not that big a deal. We're living in a culture today that's disregarding the whole ideal of sin. But to God, it is very serious. Proof, the Ten Commandments. This is the way I expect you to order your life because you are now my people. And then he starts getting into all the details behind that. God's anger will burn against his people when they sin against him in Exodus chapter 32, verse 10. When they make that golden calf and the Bible said God's anger burned against them. I don't want to be on that part of God's anger. I don't want that. I, I just really don't. You think about the idea, how the Levites, some of the Levites went through and killed 3,000 whenever they committed that sin with the golden calf, Exodus 32, verse 28, and then the plague that followed. So you see, bottom line is, Israel, as I mentioned before, is always going to interpret everything with regards to the Exodus, even going back to, as I mentioned before, in Jeremiah, where bringing back that whole idea of them coming back is part of that. Next, God is a God whose anger may be averted. God is a God whose anger may be averted. What does that mean? If you repent and you pray, then you can be forgiven. Okay? Think about this. You, you're going to see this, this whole thing over and over again. Uh, sin offerings can turn it aside, Exodus 29, 10 through 14. Uh, Leviticus gives us a lot better examples of that. Uh, so again, Moses, and one of the things we will talk about even more, whenever the children of Israel commit the sin with a golden calf, Moses intercedes in prayer. And he says, look, these are your people. But he also emphasizes what? If you won't save them, take my life. And who does that remind us of? Jesus. So you see, you see that heart there for both of them, and Jesus as well as Moses, his willingness to give his life for the people and give up, as it was, eternity itself for the people. So <clears throat> he is the God. Next, he's the God who speaks. He is the God who speaks. He is a living God. He's living and active. He's a God who reveals himself in word. And again, we mentioned this idea very quickly. I'm going through some of this stuff again. Just wanted to make sure if there's anything else I wanted to say about it. So again, this is the self-declaration of God. 
God is transcendent. That means he is above all else. And that's it. And he is a God who lives among his people. I mentioned all of that. All righty. So I did want to cover some of that stuff again and emphasize that again as we got started in the class tonight. I know I spent a little bit of time on this, but to me, the rest of the book is going to be keying in on this. All right. Now we get into the book itself. We get into the book itself. We start dealing with some other issues. Uh, I was doing more research today, brought it with me. If any of you have Unger's Bible Dictionary, some of you may have it, some of you may not. Go to uh, page 333, and it talks about the date of the Exodus. There is a debate among a lot of scholars as to when the Exodus actually took place. There's two particular dates that's going on there. And here's some things that I want you to think about. The first date that is suggested is 1441 B.C. 1441 B.C. Okay. Now, and part of the reason for this is, is because, again, you're going to read as you read in this particular dictionary, and there's some other suggestions out there. If you're reading the book of Exodus uh, from uh, Coy Roper, he takes the other date. The other date will be 1290 B.C. Okay? So 1290 B.C. So obviously, as you start thinking about the dates and everything along this line, here's some reasons. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 says, concerning the Exodus, it says this specifically about it, that <clears throat> Solomon began to build the house of Je Jehovah in the 480th year after the children of Israel will come up out of the land of Egypt. So the fourth year of Solomon's reign, when he said to have begun the temple, would be about 961 B.C. All right, so the fourth year of his reign began in 961. This is Solomon. And again, we can get pretty, pretty close to that, 961 BC. So if you add 400 and 480 years to this, it would take you back to this date. Okay? And so you have the Bible really kind of laying this out for us and emphasizing this to us in that respect. So, uh, and, and that's, again, the key that went on to understand as you're thinking about that, about that time frame, here's what's happening in Egypt, all righty? Amenhotep II, Amenhotep II, Amenhotep is the king or the pharaoh over Egypt at that particular time frame. He reigned from 1450 to 1425. He was the son of the famous conqueror, Thutmose III. Thutmose. <laughs> Thutmose, okay? So his daddy was Thutmose III. And he, he was there, so he was the one that reigned right after his daddy did, obviously, okay? And again, what's interesting about this, he was one of the, Thutmose was a famous conqueror. He did a lot to build the Egyptian empire. All right? And uh, so some people suggest the idea, well, you don't read anywhere in Egyptian literature, anywhere in the Egyptian history, where it talks about the Exodus. And this is part of the reason why we're having problems with the date. Because, but you think about it this way. With the Egyptians, the great and mighty kingdom that they were right down when a bunch of slaves left and what all happened in that respect? No, because why? Most of, most of history is written by the conquerors, right? Let's be honest. Most of history is written by the people that win. You might get some of the other histories by some of the other folks, but by and large, it's mainly written. So they're not going to be, they're not going to sit there and record all of their misfortunes. All righty. Uh, so as you're looking at this, that's the first idea that we need to key in on. And, and to me, this is a very, very important idea. I've, I've kind of held that this, this is the date. But if you look in this particular commentary uh, by Coy Roper, he holds the 1290 date, and he gives some very convincing arguments as well. So I'm just encouraging you to think about that in that respect. Here's some other reasons as you're going down through there. 
Uh, contemporary events in Palestine emphasize or substantiate that 1441 date. Huh? I'm on page, uh, oh, I'm, I've gone back to this, okay? Uh -huh. So now if you go back, if you're on this book, that particular page is you go back to page 656. It's in the appendix. It's in the appendix, okay? So I'm just emphasizing there to you, 656, uh, the rulers, he gives you the Egyptian chronology. All of this stuff is very, very good. The various dynasties. But again, there are some people that have the idea, as I said, what's going on there. Uh, some people think, again, that uh, Hatshepsut may have been uh, the possible adoptive mother of Moses. She was a fe fe uh, female Pharaoh, okay? Then her son, Thutmose, he died suddenly. So Thutmose III took over from his stepmother, Hatshepsut, and, and that's where it goes on down through there. So he does give us in this particular commentary that you're reading a lot of the details about that. So I encourage you strongly to read that in that respect. Um, another thing that's become somewhat interesting about this and this whole discussion is the dates is there was a period of time when the Egyptians were ruled by what they called the Hyksos, the Hyksos Empire. Now, that was, not a, that was not a great time in Egyptian history. The Hyksos were descendants of the Shemites. All right, you remember the Shemites. Where are the, who are they? Who are they? Him, Sham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah. So the Semites, and by the way, uh, the Jewish nation itself comes from him. So there is a suggestion that it's for a period of time, there was, and some of these people that do this are trying to tie the date back to that time. And then what happened as soon as the Hyksos were, were defeated, then these Egyptians who, because the Hyksos had some family relations, for lack of a better term, with the Jews or with the Israelites, that whenever they finally kicked them out, that's part of the reason why the Jews that were left in Egypt, according to their ideal of thinking, were the ones that were having to go through all these problems and struggles and difficulties. So the bottom line is I'm trying to emphasize all this to you is you could spend literally hours talking about what the particular date is. <clears throat> the ideal again that I'm trying to get across to you is you've got two different dates of, of about a hundred years difference there. So just understand that there are some of that. And uh, as we go through the book, it might help us again to understand and, and look at that more from that viewpoint and, and that understanding. All righty. Now we get into the book. Finally, an hour, no, two and a half, three hours later, <laughs> after the class started last week, we now get into the book itself. The book starts off chapter one, verse one. These are the names of the children of Israel. These are the names. Now, in the Hebrew, the book, that's the name of the book. Usually, as you actually read this in the Hebrew language, the name or the title of the book comes from the first few words. So beginning, in the beginning, that word has the genesis. There's that idea. In the Hebrew, it is, again, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. All righty. Now, in the Septuagint, I think I emphasized that to you last time. The Septuagint is what? Right, it's the Septuagint. And again, a lot of times if you're reading this, this is, that's the way it's shown, okay? All righty, and the reason again, for those of you that don't understand that, the reason why this is the Roman numeral 70, Okay, 70 writers. And what happened was during the time between the Testaments, Ptolemy of Egypt, Ptolemy of Egypt, <clears throat> wanted to have uh, a copy of every book in the world. So he had a, a library in, anybody remember where? Alexandria. Alexandria, very, very good, Alexandria, Egypt. 
And the reason why, again, it's called the Septuagint is because he got 70 of the scholars among the Jews, and they came down to Alexandria. They were paid handsomely and translated the Hebrew text into the Greek. And that's what became the Septuagint Bible. And I mentioned, I think, last week, I don't, you see, sometimes I don't always remember everything I mentioned, so if I repeat myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all I got to say. But you also got to remember that part of the reason why the church of the first century used the Septuagint a lot, but it wasn't used by, the Jews didn't like it, mainly because they felt like the Christians took the Septuagint and, and uh, that was the Bible they mainly used, okay? So a lot of the Jews went back, and you remember, I think I even talked about uh, there were certain group, group of Jews called the Masoretes that actually would sit down and copy the Hebrew Bible out word, word for word, okay? So the thing that I want you to key in on is they kind of, the Jews kind of turned away from the Septuagint, but this is where it gets the name Exodus. And you remember last week as well, that word Exodus is found where else in the New Testament? Luke. Very good. Luke, where? What was the event? Uh, the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration. That's right. And the Bible there translates the word Exodus by his departure. By the word departure. Okay? I mentioned that last week. So just kind of keep that in mind. So this is the reason why I got this particular name. You have now these men who came to Egypt. Now, this is just continuation of the story from Genesis. We remember how they all got down there with Joseph bringing his family down there. You find in this particular name, those that were there, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishkar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All righty. Is it everybody else mentioned or not mentioned? Well, start going into all these lists of Jacob's sons. All righty. And you see a lot of them are the same. Reuben was the firstborn. What do we remember about Reuben? Uh, yeah, he slept with one of the concubines of Jacob, but he was still her, it was, she was still his wife. So, you know, there. What happened with Simeon and Levi? That's okay. The Dinah incident where in Shechem, or the, yeah, they had taken and violated Dinah, and then they had asked all the men to be circumcised, and then whenever they were circumcised, what? They went in and slaughtered all the men of the city, okay? So because of that, and you go back to Genesis chapter uh, 49, when Jacob is giving that blessing on all of them, you can see the history. So who then becomes the one that actually starts to be the king? It's the tribe of Judah, right? Joseph had how many sons? Two. And who were they? Manasseh and Ephraim. And what's interesting, he gets that double portion in, that, in this respect. Now, you've got to remember back in those times, if you were the, uh, if you were the firstborn son, you got twice of everything. So if you had 12 sons, all right, if you had 12 sons and you were the firstborn son, then what? You get twice as much as anybody else would. But then you would also be considered to be the patriarch, and you would be the one that's going to have to take care of the family from here on out. So, interestingly enough, Reuben is not because of his situation. Simeon and Levi is not. So it actually becomes Judah. But isn't it interesting that as in Genesis, especially verse 50, or chapter 50, whenever Joseph comes before his daddy, he has his two sons, and these two sons actually become what? Manasseh and Ephraim, which becomes part of the tribes of Judah. So they're actually getting that double portion in that sense, because he's blessing those two sons. They're now mine, and therefore what? Joseph's descendants got the double portion. Why? Because he was married to Rachel, and that was his favorite wife. 
there's so much more can be said about that when we talk about divorce and all this other stuff, trying to get along with that. But that's a whole other study through the book of Genesis and see this family dynamics whenever you have divorce. Okay. All righty. He emphasizes the idea all those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, 70 persons, when you go to Acts chapter 7, Stephen is giving that and says there are 75 people. Well, what's the difference? Is there a contradiction between Acts chapter 7, whenever he talks about the 75, and here in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, where he talks about 70? No, there's not a problem because Joseph was there already. And so Joseph's descendants and, and others would be a part of that. So whenever uh, Stephen is preaching that sermon in Acts chapter 7, he's just summarizing it. Uh, the Bible's going to give us a lot more detail here, but in that particular situation, he's going to summarize it quicker in that respect so that everybody can stay on, on line with it. All righty? And Joseph died, all his brothers, all that generation, but notice, and, and I've always done this in my Bible, but the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, grew exceedingly mighty. Now you've got to remember that the events that we read about in Genesis, that Pharaoh's dead. And it may very well be the son of that Pharaoh or even the grandson of that Pharaoh. And that's part of the reason why some people really are trying to emphasize when um, when the Exodus happened, because if it was, which they're trying to figure out exactly who the Pharaoh was. If it was 1290, then that Pharaoh is a fellow by the name of Ramesses. And part of the reason why, again, that they will emphasize the year 1290 is because in Exodus is going to mention the idea of the city of Ramesses being built. So that's the reason why some people think, well, he built that city and named it after himself, and that's part of the reason why. So you see, you see those dates for something that, that we struggle with trying to figure out, just like trying to figure out exactly who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. It wasn't Kirk Douglas. Okay, I'll say that. <laughs> okay, and that, that's all I'm going to say about that. All righty. So, Yul Brenner, I'm sorry. It wasn't Kirk Douglas either then, was it? See, okay, so one Yule Brenner or Kirk Douglas. So you, you know what I'm trying to say. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Y'all are going to call me on these movie things, and that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. There arose a new king. Now, verse 7 is very important to me in the fact that in the midst of everything that was going on, that God blessed them. God blessed them. Later, when we actually get into the book, we're going to see that... There were 603,550 fighting men that came out, and this is found in the book of Numbers, and it emphasizes the idea, let's suppose that every one of these, now these are just the fighting men. So you have a whole group of people that are older than the fighting men, but he's just mentioning the fighting men because again, they have to be the ones that do the fighting. Let's suppose that each and every one of these had a wife and one child, a wife and one child. So that'll get us the number to what? Close to 2 million, all righty? That's a very important thing to think about, especially later when we see about how God is going to take care of these people in a place where there's no farmland or anything else, he's taking care of that. If you key in on the fi fact and ideal as well, that you have this older generation, okay? This older generation here, this number of people leading the children of Israel or leaving Egypt could be up to 3 million. Now, I don't know how many of us really think about that. Sometimes we think, well, maybe there was just some little, little family trotting out down on the way, but no, we're talking about 3 million. Can you imagine the logistics of that? feeding 3 million people a day, a day, making sure they have enough water, not only them, but also all. Them, but also what? Fed them. And he's going to feed them the entire time that they're at Mount Sinai. And he's going to take care of them all through the numbers. 
and he's going to be with them all the way up to the time and even into Joshua when he does what? They finally defeat the Canaanites. So this is an amazing, amazing story. All right, and I'm just trying to emphasize to you how many people they may very well be in. So this new king, this new Pharaoh rose and said, come let us deal truly with them lest they multiply. And it happens in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. What is Pharaoh's major concern? Right, and at three million people? <laughs> yeah, we're talking now. Again, that's 603,000 fighting men, all righty? So they're already getting to that point. And again, this is extremely interesting as you're thinking about it, how God, even in their situation, is blessing them. And as we're going to continue to see, he's going to even bless them a little bit more. And this was their major concern. They did not want them to join up against us. So they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. What happens with, with slaves a lot of times? They're not fed enough. They're not taken care of. They're worked to death and they die quickly, right? I hate to say that, but that's the reality. That's, that's just the way that, that boils down to. And so as you think about this, they said, you know, we're gonna afflict them and so what did they have them do? They built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramesses. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that some people do believe that the 1290 date is there because Ramesses is mentioned. But again, you think about this later, Moses, again, writing my inspiration. And Moses is writing all this down. Ramesses may have been something, even a city that was made at a later date as it was, but they mentioned Ramesses because why? That was the city that was well known to them, okay? It's just something to think about and that really struggles. We struggle, like I said, with understanding that. And here's the thing about it. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, which emphasizes to me, and it's a great lesson for all of us. I think it's something that we need to constantly stress to the members of the church. We don't like to suffer but suffering makes us stronger. Suffering makes us stronger. And, and again, I think about how the folks in the 1930s suffered so much here in the United States, I mean, during the depression. And then we had even a greater affliction happen in the beginning of 1941 uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and how that all plays out. God was using this to make those people even stronger. And so the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and the Egyptians are becoming even more afraid of them as time goes on. So this is a great lesson. Anytime you're preaching about the ideal of suffering or something like that, just emphasize when you go through suffering, smile because it's making you stronger and it's making your people stronger. And that's important to do. So again, notice the idea, verse 12, the more they afflicted them. And then verse 13, the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And again, this particular Hebrew word suggests the idea with harshness. They are suffering harshly in this respect. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. All righty, in mortar, brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All righty. I have not been a brick mason, but I have seen them. I have helped people do bricks things before, you know. Uh, one job I had a few years ago, I helped haul some bricks, and then whenever it was time for them to build a chimney or something, I threw the bricks up, you know. Smaller bricks, but they were heavy, and you do that all day long. You mix that cement all day long. You mix that sand that, and all that. You're going to get tired. And so, again, here's what's going on. And notice again, you have this idea of verse 13, verse 14, all their service in which they made so serve with rigor. And in the midst of all of it, what? They're growing stronger. It's making them stronger. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom one of the name was Shipra and the other one's name is Pua. We're not sure exactly if they were Hebrews, if they were Hebrew women, that were there to aid the Hebrew women 
Okay, we're not sure of that. Or if they were actually Egyptian women that were supposed to go and aid them. So the bottom line is he spoke to them, when you do the duties of a midnight wife for the Hebrew women, and you see them on the birthing stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she may live. So the, the idea was what? Kill the boys. Why again? They were afraid of the fighting force. Okay. And so he said, if it's a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. That's what suggests to us the idea that these may very well have been Jewish or Hebrew midwives. Okay. But again, there are some, and, and, and you know, when you're reading all the material that you can on Exodus and all this, you get all these different opinions and things like that. You've got a lot of times sort through all of it, pick out what you can use and understand it. If it doesn't agree with you. Okay. Some of you may read the same material I'm reading and come up with a different conclusion. That's okay. It's not going to make a difference in my soul salvation <laughs> in that respect, but I want to emphasize, yes, ma'am. Hebrew. Okay. Right. Well, as we continue to look the story out, we're actually going to see that whenever they leave Egypt, there are some Egyptians that go with them. So it may very well be. It may very well be, and I'm just challenging us to think about this, that some of these Egyptians did begin to fall, especially after the plagues or in the middle of the plagues, when they saw the power of God, because we do see that there was a mixed company that came out with the children of Israel in, in, in that exodus. So that's the reason why I think some people believe that. I believe that they were probably, uh, I, I believe personally they were probably um, Hebrews because what Egyptian, again, think about it, these were slaves. What Egyptian woman is going to go help serve a bunch of slaves? You see, I, I don't see that, and that's part of the reason, but I did just suggest the idea out there to you because that idea has been floated among some ideas, okay? All righty. So we go on. Uh, when you do kill live, us. kill the, okay. Did somebody say something? I, you had a quick question. Um, when I look at verse 19, it, it, it talks um, from the perspective that they may be just proselytes where they, they fear God, uh, but it, they don't really take ownership of being Hebrew. They, they say, you know, Hebrew women are not like Egyptians. Right. So they don't, they don't really think. Part of the other reason that I was suggesting that they may very well have been Egyptian women. So right. there's the reason. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you can see it both ways. And mm -hmm. again, today, at this moment in time, I lean toward the Hebrew midwives. <laughs> okay. But again, you can see, and you make a very, very good point there. I appreciate you bringing that out. And that's what, this is what the class is for. We need to discuss this so that we can better understand it. I learn something all the time whenever I'm teaching a class. And that's the reason why I love to do it. The midwives fear God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. So obviously these women that are serving are being, are, are willing, are, are able to serve both the Hebrew women and the Egyptian women at this particular time. And he said, they're not like the Egyptian women for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. I think about the idea, going back to what he said earlier, that they made their children of Israel serve with rigor, made their lives bitter, made them serve with rigor. He afflicted them. But again, look at this whole context. Could it be that these Hebrew women were giving birth quickly in these situations because of what they were going through? Because they were strong enough to give birth that quickly? That's another thing to key in on and think about. Um, also, you can look at God's providence today. Right. Mm -hmm. His providence did not allow them to have children earlier. That's right. May have had them allowed them to have children earlier, even before the midwives got there. 
may have had, uh, again, God blessed these midwives because of this. Now, if you remember last semester, we had this discussion about Christian ethics, right? And we talked about, were the midwives lying to Pharaoh in this situation? Remember that whole situation? And if so, did God justify them in their lives to Pharaoh? Or were they telling the truth? I myself, again, see them telling the truth. I see them getting to try to help. And you, you got to, again, think about this. If every one of these guys here was married, so you're talking six, you know, 600,000 women, if they're, you know, not all of them going to have birth at the same time, obviously, right? Nobody can handle that situation. Nobody. But the bottom line is, it's very possible that I, I can see it happening where it'd be at least one or two a day for a while anyway, you know, for, for possibly up to a year or so, or maybe longer, right? Think about that. So, so the challenge that I'm presenting to you is, again, this is, as we're looking at this whole story here, and as we're seeing how many people's involved, all these things come into play as well. All right? Hey, Tommy. Okay, go ahead. You know, you just mentioned how many were being born a day. You think about when they get to the desert before they go in and they start dying off in order for all of them to be dead before they go to the, across the Jordan. Mm -hmm. they've, got to, they've got to have two or three dying a day at that rate, too. And that's exactly right, especially in the 40-year time frame. And so that's exactly what's got to have, start happening. So you, you think about, and Jim, you bring out a very good point, and that should be brought up again when you look at numbers. But you think about the idea of that 40-year wandering in the wilderness was really nothing more than a death march. I don't know any other way to say it than that, right? I re I've heard it referred to as one big funeral. It really was. Yeah. It was. Because that whole generation had to die. And they literally had to die. Yep. Before that after they were able to enter the land of Canaan. Now, the people dealt, dealt, or God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied, grew very mighty, and it was so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. And so now Pharaoh says, okay, this is it. We can't continue to let this happen. He then commands all the people. Now, notice the phrase, all his people. So was he commanding the Egyptians? Or was he commanding the Egyptians as well as the Hebrews? Well, as the story progresses about Moses, it seems like that the Hebrews were under this edict to where they were supposed to sacrifice their own sons. And so that's where chapter two enters and where Moses then has his salvation through what happens. Let's take about a five minute break and then we'll come back and pick up with chapter No. no. Okay, Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 2. Uh, uh, Exodus chapter 2. There was a man of the house of Levi who went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bore a son. And when he saw, she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Okay. Now, here you have this house of Levi. So we know now what tribe Le Mo Moses is from. It's from the tribe of Levi, which later becomes, the dedication later is the house of uh, the Levites. That's where I also get the term Leviticus, because it's mainly dealing with the priesthood. The woman conceived. She saw that he was a beautiful child. She hid him three months. How hard is it to hi <clears throat> hide a three-month-old baby? Why? Yeah, <laughs> they're going to cry and everything. And you can't, no matter what you try to do, you can't keep them quiet, right? And that's just part of the way it is. So when she no longer could hide him, she made an ark. This word ark is the same word that's used in Genesis 6. Talk about Noah's ark, okay? So it's, a, it's, a, it's the same exact word. Here is the words from ark of bulrushes. So probably weaved together, and she daubed it with asphalt, as the English says. So a lot of the King James would say tar or pitch or something like that along that line, made it waterproof in essence, and laid it by the reeds or in the reeds by the river's bank. Now, we now meet his sister. 
His sister is standing by the bank. Who is his sister? Who's Moses' sister? Miriam. Miriam, that's right. He also has an older brother. What's his name? Aaron. Aaron, that's right. And we know this a little bit later on as we continue to look through the text. So that's it. Now, you have the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Now, again, this is an... Huh? I did. I did. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your reminder. Now, this, again, is where we go back to the idea of the dating of the book. Again, there were those that had the idea that this may have been Queen Hatshepsut, okay? And that she was, she raised Moses up in, in the, as a prince, the prince of Egypt. You also consider the idea that, that he was raised as it was so that he would know all the Egyptian laws and so forth. But he, she would all, he would also know because his mother was there all the Hebrew and who he, what he really was, was a Hebrew, okay? So it's interesting along that line, she saw the ark and she opened it and saw the child and behold, the baby wept. Now, some people think, well, God, you know, miraculously caused the baby to weep at that moment in time. Not necessarily. If the baby had been covered and then he sees a, a, a woman that he's never seen before, now of course she's going to cry, you know? And of course that's going to, what does that do to women? Baby crying, what does that do to women? We've got to take care of those babies, right? You've got to take care of them. And, and I, I rejoice with you on that. And, and listen, I've had three sons and enjoyed eight grandchildren, and, and a baby cries. I'm going to go try to figure out what's going on, okay? Uh, but the bottom line is here you are, and, and here he is, and she had compassion on him. And said, so this is one of the Hebrew's children. So his sister said, okay, shall I go call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women? Now, if you read the account again in Josephus, and I'm continuing to encourage you to read the Josephus account, but supposedly according to Josephus and also Philo, when Moses was at this age, numerous Egyptian women were brought in to nurse the child, and they all refused it. In other words, he refused all of them to nurse the child. So none of these wet nurses, would he would take to that. But when his mother came, of course, obviously, she, he took to her. Okay, that's another little interesting tidbit that you don't get from the Bible. But again, it emphasizes perhaps the lore of the Jews, as you look at Josephus, or even Philo, who's emphasizing these things in these very small little details as you're looking at this. All righty. So they, they tried to get that, and the Pharaoh's daughter said, go, and the maiden went and called the child's mother. And now here's the end providence, God's providence. So now Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So now his mother is being paid to take care of him. Think about that. Again, God's providence is working out this whole situation in all of that. And he took the child and nursed him. Now, it's not like we do nowadays. A lot of times whenever we bring up our children nowadays, uh, usually about a year, then we start trying to wean them off the bottle. Some cultures go so far as to allow their children to, to nurse to three to four or five years old. Okay? We're not sure exactly, because again, we don't really read that much about in Egyptian war or Egyptian history when they would wean the baby. But, you know, obviously here's an opportunity. And again, as this continues on to be the child's nurse, for his mother to be the child's nurse, he would know, he would be taught that he was a Hebrew. He would be taught the laws of God. He would be taught <clears throat> again, two or three things are happening. God is providentially working things out to where Moses becomes the leader of the children of Israel. But you see, by staying in the court of the Egyptians, he would know all the protocol with regards to how you come before Pharaoh, how you, you know, how you seek an audience with Pharaoh. He would know every bit of that protocol because he would be raised up in that court. At the same time, he would have been taught by his mother who he really is and who he is really descending from. 
So it's interesting to, to key in on that idea. So the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and he called her name Moses. What does the word Moses mean? Nothing little. What? To draw out. To draw out of water. To draw out of water. And so that then becomes his name because I drew him out of the water and that really literally means drawn out. Now, the Bible at this particular time gives us from verse 10 to 11, it sums everything up, okay? He, when he actually comes to be her son, he's obviously raised in this atmosphere of the court. But he also probably, his mother still was able to contact him and touch, talk with him. So he now has to make a decision as he grows older. Josephus, and I mentioned this last week, but I again encourage you to read this. Supposedly, according to Josephus, as he served or as he was working up his way into the court of Pharaoh, he also served as a commander of an army that led in a battle against the Ethiopians and won. So Josephus is the only one that tells us about this. So it's an extremely interesting story where he got that. We don't know, but it, it adds a little bit more of an understanding to it. And also shows maybe Le Moses leadership ability and shows how even at this stage of the game, he's being trained to be the leader that he becomes. This also might help us to understand a little bit more what happens in verse 11 in the fact that he said it came to pass in those days when Moses had grown, he went out to his brethren. Well, number one, how did he know that the Hebrews were his brethren? Obviously, he had stayed in touch with mom. Obviously, she had taught him very well his real upbringing and his raising and what needed to, and, and the way he was reared. So again, as, as we think about this, how important is it that parents understand their responsibility and bringing up their children. You know, the Bible says you bring your children up in the nurtured admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, verse 4. We find that a lot of times parents or children may go the wrong way, but it's because their parents haven't been raising them the right way. The entire book of Proverbs, I think, was written by a father or by mothers in some situations, Proverbs chapter 31, to emphasize this is the way you need to live life here on this earth. Children will mainly be influenced by their parents. And you have to do it very, it has to be a discipline in your own heart and in your own life so that when the child goes out and has to meet the world, the child will be ready when he meets or she meets the world. And to me, that's a very key thing that we need to look at and, and study about and stress Again, thinking about it, especially in the Lord's church today and how many young people we're losing and why. What does it say about the parents? Well, the parents are trying to make ends meet, right? A lot of them are just trying to make ends meet. So mom and dad both have to. And so a lot of times the children uh, are not brought up or whenever they do get brought up by mom and dad, then what? Mom and dad's tired. And it's been time studying with them. The extent sometimes today, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth, the extent sometimes today of a child's knowledge of God and Jesus may take place in a Bible class setting. And think about a lot of our Bible classes, where a lot of times we're just trying to keep them happy for 30 or 40, 45 minutes until their parents come and get them and hope that maybe somewhere down the line they might be getting something from our Bible classes is it really the Bible class? Is it the Bible class teacher to teach our children the Word of God? No. Nope. nope. It is the parents' responsibility. So are we failing in the church? I don't want to trace this rabbit too far, but it's, I'm just asking some very serious, honest, earnest questions. We need to be teaching our children or teaching our parents to teach their children the way of God. And more importantly, we need to be stressing to our parents that they have to live what they teach. Okay, now I'll get off that soapbox, all righty?
And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now notice in verse 11, you have him twice in this passage emphasizing that Moses understand that these Jews are his brethren, all right? So he looked this way and that, and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. What, had ha what would have happened if, well, again, obviously, Pharaoh does get wind of it, but what would have happened? Why was he looking both ways? Because he knew what he was about to do was was going to get him in trouble. And so uh, he thought he may have hid it, hidden it. Did he at this moment in time think, because he was, and I'm challenging you to put yourself in his place. Did he may have possibly think, well, you know, I'm heir to the throne, which he may very well have been. Okay. I might could get away with this. Uh, but it also seems to think that he also was afraid to do it because why? He's looking both ways. He's trying to see if there's any witnesses. So again, we struggle with this whole situation. And it seemed like he, he got on and, and, and maybe, maybe, and again, I, we, we're just trying to put ourselves in his place. Maybe he thought he struck a blow for freedom here by killing that taskmaster. But he went out the next day and two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to one who did wrong, why are you striking your companion? Now notice here, he's trying to appeal to their brotherhood. So he, he's trying to appeal to their brotherhood. Look, who is your enemy? It's not your brethren. It is Pharaoh and his taskmasters. That's who your enemy is. Why are you fighting amongst one another? Here's another point. I'm going to take this rabbit for a moment in the church. Our job is not to fight our brethren. We've got enough fight out there to do in the world. We may have disagreements with one another. But brethren, we need to handle it. Sisters, we need to handle it the way God tells us to. Get, our, get everything back in order as much as we possibly can and keep on doing the work. Remember the battle. The battle is not amongst ourselves. The battle is out there in the world. All right. I've got off that soapbox. All righty. Then they said, well, who made you a prince and a judge over us? You think you're somebody. I hear him now. Well, well, you're no better than the rest of us. Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And he feared and said, surely this thing is known. So he killed that Egyptian, probably the man who he saved from the beating, started spreading the word. Now, there's a third point. And again, you get another great lesson here. The, how fast gossip flies. You know what I'm saying? How fast words go. I was studying with our young people at South Cobb about first uh, or Proverbs chapter 10 of the latter part of the chapter where he emphasizes the lips and the tongue and so forth. Then we'd studied last night about James 3 and I said, you know what? And I talked with him. I said, you know, you, go, you guys go to school all the time. I said, what happens? What causes a lot of fights at school? Somebody said something. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, well, what, well and, and I said, you know what's even worse than that? What happens in that respect is what? It's not that what's said was bad, though it may be. been. It's what everybody said that was said, <laughs> right? And they may not have even been there. Tongue is a deadly fire full of deadly poison, right? And the thing is, is we've got to think about this in this respect. The thing is known, so obviously Pharaoh finds out about it. He has his spies. Again, I want you to put yourself back in those situations. Pharaoh probably had his spies. It's not just the taskmasters, but he probably had his spies amongst all these people so that if there was any hint of an uprising, They'd squash it as quickly as they possibly could. So again, this is some things that maybe we don't think about when we're reading through this. We kind of just gloss over it very quickly. So, but the bottom line is all of these things come into play. And so Moses has to flee for his life. And he sought to kill Moses. And Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So he flees from Egypt 
heads toward the land and the Midianites. And finally, he sits down by a well. And obviously, he's, he's fleeing toward the south. Because later, whenever they're actually, he's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, Jethro, also known as Ruel. This is going to be on the test. You might keep think that, keep those names important. All right. Jethro, who's also known as Ruel, is going to meet him with his wife, Zephora, and his son. So just keep those things in mind because he's going to ask <clears throat> uh, Jethro to stay with him for a while. Yes, ma'am. There are two places in the Old Testament that emphasizes the Midianites. Some people do believe that they may very well have been the, uh, that. I'm remembering um, whenever I think of the Midianites, and this is where um, I wanna, I'm going to try to look it up very quickly and make sure about this. Uh, let me see, I'm wanting to say. Uh, it's Genesis. 25, Abram again took a wife and made her, na her name was Keturah. So after Sarah died, he took another wife and he, she, she bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. So now that may have come from Abraham. However, and I do believe if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to go back and remember where the descendants of Ishmael is, Agar and Ishmael depart. Um, okay, yeah, the families. And again, you have the genealogy of Ishmael. You have Ishmael, Nebai, Joth, Kedar, Abdil, Midsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadar, Hema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kadima. So I don't think he's going to be a, he's going to be a descendant of Ishmael. He's going to be, he was, he's a descendant of Abraham in, in that respect, okay? So very good question. And so it goes down to this Midianites. Now, and he sat down by this well. Now, a, the priest of Midian. Now, we know later on that we find out his name is Jethro, okay? Jethro is going to give Moses some advice when it comes down to helping lead the people. But we also know that he had seven daughters, all righty, but he's also called a priest. Now, what is a priest's job? Offer sacrifice for the family. Offer the sacrifices for the family. And obviously, he's obviously a priest of God, okay? Obviously, he knows about God. He understands about God. It's not just that he's just a priest, but he obviously knows about God as well. Um, so the question comes in, Dad, how did he know God? Later on, we know of another priest by the name of Melchizedek, or earlier back in Genesis, right? Where there's a priest by the name of Melchizedek. So there was still knowledge of God. It seems like, again, later when <clears throat> Jethro does meet him, and he reproves Moses because of what he's doing, that he rejoices in what God has done. And it seems like if he was not, and that's a good question. Did he know God at this time? We don't know, but it seems like when he hears all that God had done and how he, Moses, or excuse me, how God had delivered the Egyptians, he praises God. And, and at that, you know, so was he a believer before then or not? We're not sure. We're not sure. So they drew water. They came and drew water and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. So what did it mean by drawing water? They had to dip, dip the bucket down in the well, pull it out. If you've ever carried water, you know how heavy it could be. I again, grew up on a farm. I had to haul water sometimes, two five-gallon buckets. A gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So you get five gallons, you got 40 pounds toting that water. Try not to spill any of it because what? You don't want to have to spill it and have to go back and get some more. And we don't know how much big it was, but here these ladies were there taking care of <clears throat> the Midianites, and then the shepherds came and drove them away. Oh, well, and again, as you're reading Josephus, Josephus gives us this little hint 
that the shepherds were watching until they filled the water troughs where they didn't have to draw the water. And then they drove the women away and Moses saw what happened. He said, no, that's not going to happen. And again, he stood and helped them and watered their flock. So again, he is what? He's, he's, he's on their side. And again, he obviously was an Egyptian, probably still dressed in Egyptian garb. They would have known he was Egyptian later whenever they say, when they get back so early, uh, Jethro or also Ruel says, well, how'd you get back so fast? Well, there was an Egyptian there. Well, how'd they know he's an Egyptian? Probably because he was dressed that way. Probably that's what he had. So it's interesting as you, you look at the details of the story as they are alluded to, Again, we have to stick mainly with scripture because that we, was we know to be inspired. His father says, well, or their father said, why is it that you couldn't come so soon today? An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. He drew. vital for us to understand that so Moses was content to live with a man and he gave Zephora his daughter to Moses now how old was Moses here at this stage of the game probably was about 40 40 then he lives another 40 years with Jethro and rule or rule and Zephora and then that's when God calls him and he's 80 years old we know that he, the Bible tells us he died at 120, according to Deuteronomy. So we always break his life down the first 40 years, the second 40 years, and the third 40 years of Moses' life. All right? So she bore him a son, and he called his name Gershom. What does Gershom mean? I've been a stranger in a foreign land. So that's exactly what that particular, I've been a sojourner. I'm a, I'm a stranger, a sojourner. All righty. So what happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died? Again, this gets us back to the idea of exactly who was this, and that's where the struggles are. And you could read volumes about this in one way or another. But notice the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came to the God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered. And I think I mentioned earlier, God is a God who remembers. So it's not that he just remembers like he's forgotten, but it's a God who acts. So he remembered this covenant that he made with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. And he heard their groaning and he looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged. So God heard, God acted, or now begins the act. And he now what? He acknowledged them. He remembered what he was going to do with the children of Israel. It's not like he forgot. All this time he's been taking care of them, right? We saw that in chapter one. Every time they make it harder, the children of Israel are blessed more and more and more. So God is still, was still taking care of them all through this time. Did the children of Israel know that? No, they didn't have a clue. How many of us, and here's another key lesson to think about, none of us know the thinking and the way God acts in so many situations. God is still acting on our behalf now, even though we may not see it, even though we may not even acknowledge it. God knows the beginning and the end from the very, you know, from the very beginning to the very end, doesn't he? He knew, he knew what I would grow up to be. He allowed me to be put 
in certain places at certain times. This gets into the idea of predestination a lot. It gets into the idea, well, that, well, if that's the case, then you had no choice in the matter. Yes? Yes, I had choices. God is able to know the future and still allow us the free will to make choices. That's the key to key in on. Some people think, again, that God, because God foreknows something, that it has to happen that way. Well, not necessarily. Think about parents bringing up children. Your children, you know the child, you know their, you know their whims, you know their struggles, you know their difficult, you know the way they act. Just because you know the child is about to make a bad decision, and you allow them to do that, now you could have stopped it, couldn't you? But sometimes you have to allow the child to make those bad decisions so that they will learn, right? Sometimes you don't really know that that because we're human beings. God knows it all. So you do have that ideal of providence, but there are some religious groups that believe in predestination to the point that no matter what, we're going to be what God decided we were going to be. And that takes out man's free will. And that's where we have to, and this is where we, we because the Bible doesn't really talk about this in a lot of detail. God in the very beginning gave, did God know that Adam and Eve would sin? Yes. Ephesians tells us that before the foundation of the world, he and Jesus and the Spirit planned for the salvation of mankind. So he knew Adam and Eve would sin. Now, a predestinarian would believe, well, they had to sin as a result of that. No. He still gave them the choice. Why? Why? Because, again, it goes back to the ideal of love. You can't really love somebody unless you choose to love somebody. And God wanted a part of his creation to love him in the way that he was loving them. And the only way they could do that was by giving them a choice. So this is where, again, a lot of struggles go on in, in that respect. Um, Moses is looking at it. We're looking at it now strictly from Moses' viewpoint. He may have at one time thought, well, I'll lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He may have thought that he struck a blow for freedom when he killed that taskmaster. But it didn't work out that way. And for the next 40 years, as he's shepherding sheep, which God was using to prepare him for what he had to do, to watch out for all the sheep, he probably thought his life was going to end on the backside of a desert, watching sheep. We've often said that part of the reason for that second 40 years of Moses' life was to humble him. Think about this in our own lives. All of us probably admit to this. When we're young, we, we think we've got the world by the throat, and we think we can do anything. We spend a lot of time learning, hmm, well, maybe I can't do everything that I needed to. And by the time we're older, then it's like, what? I'm a lot wiser now. So what? There's some things that I wanted to do when I was younger, but I'm not, I, I'm kind of surprised. Maybe some of us are kind of surprised the way our lives wound up. I never would have dreamed that I'd have been a preacher. Never, ever. But we kind of surprised the way our lives wind up. God knew about it all from the very beginning to the end. So again, that discussion is, is it's a hard discussion to have, but I think it's mainly because, and I'm trying to share with you some of the things I'm sharing, it's mainly because we don't know God. There's no way about, there's some things about God we cannot know. So when we're trying to figure all this out in our own minds and in our own hearts, this is where we struggle. This is where we have, you know, this is where we falter. God in his wisdom, is able to allow, even though he knows what's going to happen in the future, in his wisdom, he allows us to make our choices so that the responsibility of our lives is really on us. Amen?
Now, can anybody explain that any better than that? Okay, I, you know, if you can, I'll let you uh, deal with that the next time we have class, okay? But I'm just, it's, it's a big challenge. And again, the only thing I could come up with is again, we don't know God as well as we think we know God sometimes. Now, if we make a God in our image, then that God's gonna become like us, right? And I thank God that God is not like us. All righty. So, we read earlier, back in chapter 2, verse 18, that he came to Ruel, their father. Ruel is another name for Jethro. Here in chapter 3, at verse 1, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Okay? And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, one of the things we're also going to discuss as we continue to go through the book of Exodus is we're going to have a hard time pinning down where all these places are, especially when we start seeing the route when they left Egypt and traveled down to Mount Sinai. The best we can understand, and there are some people down in uh, Saudi Arabia that think that they've got it. There's actually a, a monastery up there, supposedly on Mount Sinai, but that's a whole mountain range. So we're not sure exactly where Mount Sinai is. And so as we continue to look at this, especially in 13 and 14, as we're traveling, I just want to remind you of the fact that some of this stuff, we're going to have a hard time figuring out positively where it is. All righty. So, he was on the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb. Horeb is another name for what? Horeb is another name for Mount Sinai. Okay? Always remember that. Horeb and, and, and is always going to be the same name of Sinai. All right. Now, chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 2. We are introduced. <clears throat> We are introduced to somebody that we really haven't really met before, the angel of the Lord. All right? Notice that the term, and again, if you're reading from the English Bibles, this A is capitalized. And usually whenever this word is capitalized, it suggests the idea, it's kind of like when we use the term now remember in the hebrew and in the greek there were capital letters okay okay there is is it in the king new king james version in chapter three at verse two the angel of the lord angel is capitalized okay i know but angel is not you're reading from the king james yeah okay some of the newer translations do put that there all right, we can spend a little bit of time talking about that. There is a great lesson. If any of you get any polish in the pulpit lessons, Jody Apple, who is the preacher at Dahlonega now, did a lesson on this subject. So this would be another thing that might encourage you on the subject call of the angel of the Lord. And this phrase, the angel of the Lord, has been looked at he, this particular angel seems to be different from every other angel you have michael you have gabriel you have the seraphim you have the cherubim uh, cherubim all right it's, it seems to be that this particular angel is separate and apart from all the other angels and jody apple makes a very 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 good point that this could very well be did you hear the word could be jesus in pre-incarnate form, okay? Okay? So this could be Jesus in pre-incarnate form. <clears throat> I want to encourage you for your own personal study to study that. If you have the opportunity, pull up that particular lesson from Polishing the Pulpit. Um, I think it was 2018. It was 2018.
first get something from house to or from the uh, brother Jacksonville to see if there's a way that we can provide a link to that. Okay. But that would be a very, very, very good listen uh, sermon for you to listen to. So here you have this angel of the Lord. By the way, this angel of the Lord may very well have been in some of these other situations, even in the book of Genesis. Uh, this angel of the Lord may have very well have been the one that Jacob was wrestling. Okay. And remember, he was struck on the thigh. Remember, where was that found in Genesis? Um, you just read it. Okay, you see, we all, here he is. It's Genesis 32, 22. And um, here he's, he call, he's not called an angel, but you see there in, in, in my version, in the New King James Version, it says chapter 32, 24, Jacob was left alone and a man. And in my Bible, it's the man's capitalized. Okay, but it's not in the King James. Okay, all righty. So there are some things to think about. <clears throat> Notice if you look in verse 25. Now, again, it may not be, but it seems like in 24 and 25 and 26 and 27 and 28, every one of the male pronouns, okay, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was joined, uh, out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. I will not let you go unless you bless me. He said, what is your name, Jacob? And he said, every one of those he's is capitalized in the New King James Version. We suggest that these translators seem to think that this again was Jesus in the flesh in pre-incarnate form. We can, we can look at this and study this all day long. I'm just, I'm just showing you and emphasizing this to you up front so that you might be able to understand where some people are getting this idea and where it goes from there. Um, and there are some that believe that, some that not. And again, some of you are mentioning that idea that, that you think you've heard that before. So uh, again, Jody Apple's lesson maybe give you a little bit more understanding about that. All righty. And he sees this angel and uh, he looked, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now notice this angel of the Lord appears himself as a flame of fire. All righty. Now that says a lot. We, we think about the idea that uh, he's coming again with flaming fire, taking vengeance on them with his holy angels, as he emphasizes in the book of 2 Thessalonians. So the idea is, is that here you have, but the bush was not consumed with fire. And he said, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight while the bush does not burn. So when Mo, the Lord saw that he turned aside and look. Now notice again, the Lord here is capitalized. So again, this is Yahweh. God, so here you have both names, Yahweh and, and El, called to him said, Moses, Moses. Ah, he said, here I am. Do not draw near this place. This, your, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now what made it holy? God was there. Now that again emphasizes to me that this angel of the Lord may very well have been Jesus. You can do your own study and you can come to your own conclusions about this, but wherever God is, that place is holy. Heaven is holy. Why? That's where God is. So as you think about this, it was holy ground because he was there. And so he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the patriarchs. And again, this is how the children of Israel would always identify themselves, being the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hit, hit his face, for he was afraid to look upon whom? God. Now, stop for a moment. He's looking at a manifestation of God in this burning bush that does not burn up, which is tied to the angel of the Lord. So Moses is believing, and again, he was hiding his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Now I want you to remember that because later in the book of Exodus, 
we're going to act, see Moses say, I want to see your face. Exodus 34. And God's going to say, you cannot see my face, for if you see my face, you will die. But he does allow Moses to see the back parts of God. Yeah. He walks by him and he sees the back parts of God. This is what is called, uh, uh, again, it's an anthropomorphism. And it's anthro, anthro, in other words, where God is, God is a spirit, right? They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So a spirit, Jesus will say, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. Yet over and over and over again throughout scripture, you see God's eyes, you see God's hands, you see in Exodus 34 where he's going to see the back part of God and we're sitting there like, and I think it's God or may very well again be Jesus in this pre-incarnate form, allowing him to see him this way. Okay. So as we look at that, that's, that's possibly the way he's going to be able to see. And again, he was afraid to look upon God here at this place, but later he developed such a relationship with God, he asked to see God face to face. When the children of Israel are at Mount Sinai, there's thunders and lightning all over the place, and Moses goes up into that. But does he ever actually see God? No, because we've understand the Bible passages that no man can see God and live. Why? Because God is so holy. And yet again, we have Moses on Mount Sinai. We have Isaiah in Isaiah 6, where he's brought into the temple of God. And he sees the cherubim and all singing, or excuse me, the seraphim singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And he hid his face because he was afraid to see God. We see the same thing again in Ezekiel chapter 1, the cherubim. You know, the wheel in the wheel, middle of the wheel, that whole thing. We see it again in Revelation 3 and 4. No, I'm sorry, 4 and 5. Where John is taken to heaven, and he sees not only the throne room of God, but he also sees the Lamb, right? So these are, these manifestations of God are God presenting himself in ways that man can understand. Okay. If he's a spirit, again, we're, we're struggling, you know, and again, our minds kind of explode a little bit trying to understand that, but we're trying to understand God as he's revealing himself to us. All right. So the Lord says what? I have seen the oppression of my people who are in, in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters and their sorrows. Notice he said, I've seen. That suggests he sees with a what? An eye, right? He hears. What does that suggest? He hears with his ears. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the land of the place of the... Okay. Somebody saying something? Okay. To the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. That becomes a mantra too throughout the Bible. Okay. This becomes this, this, this last phrase. Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and the Hivites. And the okay? I want to remind you about that because um, what we see is this earlier back in Genesis, God says the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So this is, he said, I'm going to bring you to that land. So the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have seen the oppression with which the children of Israel oppressed them. Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay, Moses, I'm going to send you to bring them out. Now, earlier, I think he did strike a blow for freedom. Now, 40 years later, he said, I'm not your guy, God. I'm not the fellow. Sometimes for us to be used by God, we have to be humble. And sometimes we think we could do, you know, Especially, as I said, as we grow older, we become more humble because we realize what we can and can't do. And I think that's the case with Moses. But it also says a lot about Moses' stamina. If he's 80 years old now at this time, 
he's about to leave the children of Israel out. And the Bible, or the, the, the chapter on Moses' life is going to close with saying that he, his strength did not abate one single solitary bit. That at the age of 120, he was still able to do what needed to be done. Wow. Yeah, wow. That's amazing in and of itself as well, isn't it? So he says, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh. Now, here's again where God's providence come in. Who am I? He's humbled himself. But he's the perfect man for the job because he knows Egyptian court protocol. <laughs> he's also the man for the job because, why? He's now humbled enough to where God can use him. At no time are we going to say, See that Moses says, look what I've done, with the exception in Numbers chapter 20. When he, out of anger, instead of speaking to the rock like God told him to, strikes the rock and says, shall we bring water from this rock for you? Suggesting him and Aaron. And that's what got God upset and why Moses was not allowed to enter into the land of Egypt or Canaan, right? Because of the fact that he took that honor to himself. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where that's found. Not off the top of my head. I'll try to find it. Maybe you could find it this week, but he was a very meek man. He was the meekest man. And I think it's, I, I want to say it's whenever um, his brother and sister challenged him. Um, um, so that would be in the book of uh, Leviticus, I think. Maybe not. It may be in Numbers. It may be in Numbers 12. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Number 12 and 3. Numbers 12, verse 3. 3. Let's see. see, see, see. Yeah, yeah. The man, Moses, was very humble more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. So, okay. So, now again, if so, again, the King James Version said he was very meek. And so a lot of times, a lot of people attach the ideal of meekness with the ideal of weakness. But meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. So again, that's, I like the phrase here in the New King James Version. That's a little bit better with the idea he's very humble. Again, except for, like I said, in Numbers chapter 20, when he speaks to the, or strikes the rock and says, speaks to the rock. So I'm not your man, guy, God. I'm not him. Who am I that I should bring him out? And God said, I will certainly be with you. That is some of the most encouraging words you will ever hear from God. Remember in Matthew 28, as he gave the great commission, he will say in verse 20, I will be with you to the end of the age. Amen. We remember how in other passages of the New Testament, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. And there he's quoting from the Old Testament. We have the Apostle Paul saying in Philippians 4 verse 11, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those are favorite passages for us. But for us to be able to be that way or to have that kind of promise, we have to go with God. How many of us go half cocked? How many of us a lot of times make plans to do great things for God and we don't get bring God in on the question? Think about that for a moment. How often do you think God thwarts our plans because we've not even talked to him about our plans. I want this church to be 300 plus people. Okay. So we're going to work real hard and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And we're going to invite and we're going to do all this other stuff. And that's great. But did you get God in on it? Could that be part of the problem of a lot of churches today? We think we've got to do it all and we don't take God in the picture. We have to have God in the picture. When we make huge decisions, we, we do pray a lot about it. 
But again, it's something to think about. Listen, the children of Israel were not delivered by Moses. They were delivered by God. And again, the church today will be the church it needs to be if God is in the picture. I can't emphasize that enough. And I'm preaching to myself because again, how many times have I done things or said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. God has to be in the picture. So if you're learning to be a teacher, a Bible school teacher, a, a, a preacher or something like that, you've got to think about it this way. You better have God in the picture. You better be talking to God about everything. All the time. Every day. It's got to be, he's got to be, you know, and it's not, how often do we talk to God? When we've got to make some big decisions. When we've got some big problems. Look, if, we, if we're in a relationship with God and we're talking to him every day, then maybe those big problems or those big decisions are going to be a whole lot easier to make. I, I can't emphasize this enough. And I just want to stress this to all of our, all of our preachers and everybody's thinking about becoming a preacher. Always, 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 always keep God in the picture. So you see, Moses realizes what? I can't do this. And so God says, I will be with you. And this will be a sign that I've sent you. When you have brought the children of people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Okay, God, that, that sounds like a good promise, but I can't see the future like you do, and I don't see it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And how many of us, you know, we think about that. I can't see the future. We try to, we try to make the decisions based on what we think might happen. But we can't, well, I'm trying to think about the best way to say this. But if it doesn't go the way we think it happened, or should have happened, we have to realize that we can't be held responsible for what could happen. See what I'm trying to say? I don't know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it very well, but I'm trying to say it. You know, there could be a lot of other things going on behind the scenes that God knows about that we don't that may be stopping us from doing a certain action or a certain item. And this goes back to God's providence again. And this goes back to the immutability, the fact that we don't understand everything about God. So we just have to live by faith to say, okay, Lord, that's not the way I'd plan to do it, but that's okay. If that's what you want me to do, that's what I'll do. So he says, and even though he couldn't see it, he, you know, he said, here's going to be the sign. Here's going to be the thing. You and all the children of Israel are going to be around this mountain. Well, before Exodus is over, they're going to be all around the mountain again. But Moses would have never thought it was going to happen the way it had happened. Here's another thing. Let God use you. Let God use you with your abilities, your talents that you have at that moment in time. Let God use you. And then when those great surprises happen, Revel in God's glorious power. Okay. Hey, Tommy. Yeah. Moses has the same problem that we have many times. We need to get out. Of, we need to get ourselves out of the way. That's exactly right. And that's what I see God helped him do in those 40 years yep. on the backside of the desert. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right and you see even that i understand what you're saying there and, and don't misunderstand me i'm not i'm not fussing at you but even taking up the slack you know well it sounds like it's my plans let god take no the more we're in god's will the more we'll understand his will and it's not him taking up the slack we're the ones being used in that situation yeah That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. God's going to take it. That's it. Yeah. And I understand what you're saying, you know, and, and I hope you didn't think I was trying to fuss at that. that no, but, but you see what I'm trying to say. But sometimes we do have that attitude. Well, you know, I'll do my part. And God better do his. No, 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 no. Let's get this right. Let God do and use us the way he wants to use us. And then it's going to turn out the way God wants it. Hey, Tommy. Mm -hmm. 
He's, he will take care of it. Yeah. Brother? God, how many times in the Bible does God say, if you will do, I will do? He's mm -hmm. always done his part when we've done our part. That's exactly right. Always. And so that emphasizes to us all the more how important it is that we get back to doing what we're supposed to be doing instead of doing what we wind up doing a lot of times. Using our, also our thoughts, our ways to build a church when God's already given us, here's the way I want it done. Here's the way it'll work. You preach the gospel. You share, you, you go out there and you take care of the widows, the orphans. You take care of the homeless. You try to do what you can to help those in need every way you can. That's what I want you to do. But I figure if we can hire the right preacher at the right time, then we'll explode. No, 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 no. It's not the preacher. It's God. So God said, I'll be with you. So Moses said to God, well, when I come to the children of Israel and you say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? Now here, notice this phrase, verse 13. What is his name? They're going to want to know. That's right. You're exactly right. I am what I am. Okay. And the thing is, again, the name is the person. The name identifies the person. What shall I say to them? And he says, I am who I am. Let's unpack that for just a moment. What does that mean? I am what I, who I am. Everything. I'm everything, number one. So he is our all in all. What else? Okay. All right. I think it's there. It's that idea as well. One person has chatted and texted this. He said, he will be forever who he is. Isn't that encouraging? Yeah, I like that. He is past, present, and future. There is no time with God. And I stress that. So again, I am who I am. I'm never going to change. I will always be God. I will always be in charge. I will always get my will done one way or another. It's up to you whether you want to be a part of my will or not. And, and I think that may be part of the reason why he says, this is what you say to them. Because when he goes back and tells them God is going to deliver them, they're all excited until Pharaoh says, you're not working hard enough. Now you got to go out and get the brick or straw for the bricks and you can't slack up. And then what do they do? This happens in Exodus five. They all come blame Moses. That's all your fault. And Moses is sitting there like, God, you sent me to deliver them. I can't. And God's saying, no, Moses, it's not you doing it. It's me. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And again, we avoid that. I avoid that. We don't like that. Things have to get worse before they get better. And we ask us, why? Because we have lessons to learn. Right? So the thing that he's, these words, I am who I am, should be an encouragement to them. But did they understand that? Do we really grasp that? Do we really understand that statement, I am who I am? Do we think about the big implications in those five words about who God is? When's the last time you ever heard any sermon preached on this? You see the challenge? And Moses is going to go back and preach to the children of Israel, this is who God is. And they're going to say, who is he? I am who I am. Huh? What? What does that mean? How's that going to play out? Well, he's the God who's always there. He's the God who is unchanging. He is the God that's going to do what he said he's going to do. Even though things are going to get worse before they get better, God is still going to do what God said he would do. Now, isn't that encouraging? And shouldn't that even bring comfort to our hearts? And he said, you shall say, I am has sent me to you. 
You tell the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, you see one thing about them, because they stayed where they were in Egypt, I know that believed that they may have been influenced by the Egyptian gods, but they were still a race of people for themselves. And all of them could sit back and say, well, if we can't, if we don't understand anything else, we do understand that God made a promise to our forefathers to bless us. And now he has blessed us with possibly two to three million people in the land of Egypt, right? But you see, we're still having problems. So how in the world is he going to really bless us? Is this really a blessing? Is that the question? And he says, he said, this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. We really need to grasp and understand what he means when he says, I am who I am. Because this defines who God is. So one of the great things you could possibly do is chew on that for a few minutes and think on that. I'm going to sit down for a moment and look at the, uh, try to remind myself of the, what uh, Brother Roper said about this. And uh, when he says, I am who I am. Also, <clears throat> who am I? I am who I am. All righty. Another way you could translate this, this is on page 59 of the commentary. Another way you could translate this is, I will be who I will be. Or, I will be what I will be. Scholars say the meaning of the phrase suggests that God is the essence of being. He is the ground of being. So again, he's emphasizing he wants to be known by this name. He chose from this point forward to be known by his personal name, Yahweh. Yahweh is to be his memorial name for all generations. The New Revised Standard Version says, this is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. So if you want to do a great study to help build yourself up, this is one. Because again, this God is the God that's still in charge. This God is the God that's still going to do what he said he was going to do. It, seems to me it's all it is. It, 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 the thing includes every characteristic of God that we've studied about the last two class lessons. And by the way, I've just barely touched the hem of the garments. Because again, if we really studied all the details of God's holiness, all the details of God's power, all the, the details of his knowledge, all the details of his wisdom, all the details of his forgiveness, all the details of everything else, will we, can, let me ask you this question. Let's think about this for a moment. Can we really understand, and I mean really understand, how God forgives us or why? To be able to understand that, we'd have to understand how much he loves us. Can we really understand that? No. That's, that's the thing that I keep thinking about. When you know, um, we talk about love, mm -hmm. people try to equate our love with God's love. And they try to put you on a level of love that God loves. And, and, and they set you up. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can't love like God loves. Well, but yet at the same time, we, we have to as much as we possibly can. Yeah. We I will mean, never be perfect in that you know, love. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Sometimes people put this sort of eternity. When we talk about love, mm -hmm. we play it like that God loves and there's no way we're going to be able to do that the closest we may ever come to it 
as we as if we become a Stephen. Yeah. That's the closest we'll ever come to it. Is if we become a martyr. That's it. Jim Gentry wrote on his little sit here. He said he is all he can be and will help us to be all we can be. I like that. Godfrey Fisher says, I will be whatever the situations demand that I be for you. Good thoughts, good ideas. And you see, that's, that's the idea that we need to emphasize it. And so again, we have to, he will be forever who he is. Aren't you glad? <laughs> I like this. Aren't you glad that there is someone that I can love that's never going to change? You know, we all change. We all, we all change from what we used to be. We, we, but the reality is God is never going to change. God's love is always going to be there. So again, it's just, it's such a challenge to all of us. That's such a challenge to all of us to think about that. Let's stop there. We've got about 10 minutes left in the class and I didn't give you a second break. So I want you to go home and study for yourself. Look at some other commentaries about what they say that this I am what I am. Let's come back next week and talk about this a little bit more. And then we'll go further into the book. Okay. All righty. So there's your homework for this week. All right. Thank you. Good thank class. You, good class. Yeah. That's right. I'll right. be praying. Y'all have a good week. Hey, I have, more I have a couple of questions. Okay, Rex, go ahead. Okay, um, in your um, um, synopsis, uh -huh. um, on the assignments, it uh -huh. says, it says, read Jehovah's uh, Book 3, Chapter 19. Now, I think I found Book 3, but, the, but there, it only goes to Chapter 15. Hmm. As I see it, book two is book two, chapter nine through book I, three. I, I found it. Yeah, let me look at. Uh, I could have put down the wrong thing there. Give me a second, and I will uh, look it up for you. All righty. And and the other the other question on number five. Uh huh. Uh, it says a five-page written paper on the importance of Exodus and understanding the history of Israel as well as how it, and it just sort of stops there. Yes, that was a mistake. <laughs> I, what I was going to go ahead and say is how it affects the church, how our understanding of Exodus has found a lot of the thing, and, and I'm going to point this out to you as we go through there, uh, but how the book of Exodus affects uh, our understanding of the church and so forth in the New Testament. For example, the ideal of the tabernacle, how does that affect the church? The ideal of the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord's Supper, the ideal of the Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Jesus is our Passover lamb. That kind of stuff is what I'm talking about. Okay. So I apologize I didn't get that out, and I'll try to send you a revised copy of that this week. All righty? Thank you, Brody. I thought I had corrected that, but um, obviously I didn't. So we'll, I'll try to get all that worked out and uh, get that addendum to this syllabus. All righty. Thank you. Thank every one of you for all of your being here with me and you're helping me. And uh, I appreciate you guys so very, very much. Have a good week. Have good a good week too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. How you doing?